Welcome to Sri Lanka. Lying off the southern tip of India, this tropical island has attracted many visitors throughout the centuries. With its natural beauty and strong culture, Sri Lanka is also world-renowned for its majestic gemstones of many varieties, most notably sapphire, which we hope to uncover on our visit. In 1292, merchant traveller Marco Polo travelled through India and onto the island known as Ceylon. Marco Polo wrote in his records, the island of Ceylon is, for its size, the finest island in the world, and from its streams comes rubies, sapphires, topazes, amethyst and garnets. Those in the gem trade knew of the island not as Ceylon, but affectionately as Ratna Dweepa, which directly translates to Gem Island, a reflection of its natural wealth. During this show, Steve Bennett will show us firsthand where some of the most sought-after gems in Sri Lanka are mined, and will take us to the heart of the gemstone trade in Sri Lanka, China Fort Market. Before leaving for our first destination, one of our gem hunters, Brian, shows Steve around the city of Colombo, where some historical and religious sites belong. Visiting Colombo's famous Buddhist temple where they receive blessing and faith bracelets that are believed to keep travellers safe and bring good fortune to their trip. After some more sightseeing and blessed with excellent weather, Steve hits the road to travel to their hotel for a rest before a busy day. The next morning we speak to Brian about the famed Paparaccia Sapphire, named after the lotus flower, exhibiting lotus pinks and sunset oranges all in one gemstone. Yeah, let's start our journey with this great flower lotus. You, the great stone, Patrasa Sapphire, name came from this great flower lotus. Yeah, it's a lot more vivid pink than I ever sort of dreamt it'd be. I always thought it'd be a bit more orangey, but uh, still beautiful nonetheless. And what have you done with the weather? <laughs> is it, is it going to be like this the whole trip? <laughs> it's, it's going to be, I think it's going to be like this all the way. I thought Sri Lanka was sunny <laughs> and warm. I didn't expect to come into the rain. It's the rainy season here. Ah, <laughs> oh, <the, okay>, it's, <laughs> it's going to get dry. Yes, yeah. <laughs> With this in mind, Steve is keen to travel to the first mine in Ratnapura, over 100 kilometres east from Colombo, where our gem team have learned about a guaranteed supply of quality sapphire. Ratnapura is so celebrated for its beautiful gemstones that its name literally translates to City of Gems. So how do you get around in Ratnapura? You get around in one of these things, big cars that struggle with the little uh, dirt tracks, and this is how the miners get to and from the mine each day and they've kindly lent me this one. It's beautiful, it's become my best friend. During the monsoon season, it is unusual for rain to last all day, with downpours causing short and sharp flash floods. Thank you. Upon arrival, Steve is invited to venture down the mine shaft for a closer look at the mining process. Most of the gemstones in Sri Lanka are found in a relatively small area known by locals as the Highland Series, which sits between two mountain ranges. This is the Cascalier level that we're at now. It's uh, five metres down in the shaft. Uh, it's been raining a lot over the last couple of weeks. In fact, it stopped the mining for uh, a few days. Uh, then you can hear the generators in the background pumping out the water. They found a, a few weeks ago a few pieces of beautiful sapphire. Uh, and now we're going to go out a bit like a bicycle wheel. It's going to go out, we're in sort of, you come down in the middle of the, of the wheel and now they're going to take spikes off uh, in different directions to actually try and find the gemstones. Uh, I'm standing right underneath the uh, bucket so I better move. <laughs> yeah. He's showing me the new beam that he's uh, just put in place. That's just come down uh, on, the, on, on, the, on the bucket. Uh, and between the two of them, they've just actually placed that beam in place. And now they'll start tunneling just below the beam. Excellent, guys. Working in harmony with the local farmers, once all spoke tunnels radiating out from the central shaft become mined out, the shafts are refilled with soil. The farmers then move back in and replant with rice or tea to responsibly preserve this beautiful landscape and habitat. 
The 10 to 20 kilogram deposit bags are filled with sore soil and hoisted to the surface via a pulley. Where the dirt is separated from the potential rough, also known as scree. One of the reasons we travel around the world to, to visit many of the mines is to check on the working conditions to make sure they're safe, to make sure the ventilation is good, that they've got the right protection, the right tools. Uh, and other than the bare feet that we've all got because it's so slippy today with the monsoon, I can reassure everybody at home when you're talking about Sri Lanka, all the, all the structures are very, very strong indeed. The walls are all absolutely solid. And I'd have no hesitation at all of working down in a mine shaft like this. So with Sri Lanka, for sure, everything you get is ethically, mi ethically mined uh, and the mines are very, very safe indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. A few days ago, they found a piece that they reckon they can cut into a sapphire. Not the best clarity, but about five or six carats. So uh, the indications are always good. Whenever you're mining, whether it's here or Brazil, it's all about indications. You might not have found the big one yet, but if you keep finding small pieces, even if they're included, you know there's a chance that you might find a big one very, very shortly. Slightly different though to mining when you're in the host rock. Host rock, you tend to hit pockets and you go through a, a, like a, 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 an area into an opening and where it's all crystallized, that's called host rock mining. Then there's a big indication. Here's a little bit different because with alluvial, it, it's more about the weights and how they fall uh, in the soil over the years. But uh, fingers crossed, the guys all seem very happy and they feel like they're, they're onto something big. After a few hours, Steve decides to travel to a much deeper mine, but detour to what is known as a wet mine. A lot of miners around the world say they mine in their back garden. Rohan really does. His house is just here, and his mine is some 20 metres over here. Pad Pradasha on your front door. That would be my dream. It's not just about shaft mining. These are open pits. And this particular mine here, uh, a great pad for Asher came out two and a half years ago that sold in the local market for over two million dollars. That's about one and a half million pounds. The mine owner works with his team as a cooperative, so they all made quite a lot of money out of that deposit. And while they're away right now, they're not worried about this, this area because it's full of water. So therefore, it's acting, if you like, uh, as, a, as a big safe deposit box. Stopping for a bite to eat, Steve tries a local delicacy known as hopper. This is a paper-thin flour-based pancake cooked on an open flame and filled with chilli. A perfect hearty gem hunting meal. After refreshment, Steve sets off to a second, much deeper mine, just 30 minutes away to see the differences between the two locations. The beautiful city of Ratnapura is surrounded by many mountains and is the source of one of the largest rivers in the country. Numerous waterfalls and stunning valleys add to this natural paradise. This mine is situated in a small village known as Dala, which is only accessible via a rickshaw, locally known as a tuk-tuk. On arrival, Ajmar Uwais, a specialist in salon sapphires, explains how the mine owner, Mr Apu, set up a tea plantation to help local employment providing continuous wages even when the mine isn't producing gemstones. And all year round or? All year round, all year round. Not seven men. And we're more south here, four. so more of these sort of English breakfast teas Five, in the eight, north. In the north. This is mid-country. So what, where do you export ah. this to? This and the other one are mostly the other countries like uh, East Europe, right. Middle East. Oh, biggest buyers are the Middle East. Is it stronger or? Stronger, stronger yeah. in flavour. Right. But they like it strong. <laughs> Impressed with the land conservation, Steve is taken to a mine shaft that has been in operation for nearly six months and is roughly 35 metres deep. Unfortunately, as the depth of the mine had become much deeper, we were not prepared with the correct lighting equipment for filming. 
However, Steve still felt obliged to venture down the shaft with the miners to experience firsthand all the effort that goes into the incredible alluvial mining process. How long have you been working this hole? About two weeks to come down? Uh, Last gig of it, uh, How much time? Three months. Three months? Three months. Wow, three months. It's a uh, hell 35 meters. 35 meters. Yeah, you, and uh, I'm out of breath coming down there. That's quite a long way down, isn't it? Yes. Quite yes. a long way down. And because we're in the monsoon season, you can hear, well, we just turned the generator off now, but they're, they're having to pump this out and pump this out because literally the one next door that we just walked past has completely, completely flooded. Steve is told by a miner named Balib that conditions down the mine are basic, though very safe. A mining barefoot is necessary to descend down the shaft efficiently. Oh, that's the telephone ringing. Yes. <laughs> literally, we, we're not joking about the telephone. They actually just shout down a, a one and a half inch pipe and you hear it revert all the way around the mine. He explains, though it is damp and cool, the miners appreciate this change from the humid conditions on the surface. In Sri Lanka, gemstones are mostly found in alluvial deposits where they once came to rest in ancient riverbeds. This is because as a flowing river reaches a bend, on the inside of the curvature, the flow of water decreases and any gemstone being carried by the flow tend to be dropped. As the gemstones are typically much heavier than the host rock they were formed in, the gemstones tend to become embedded in the floor and slowly fall deeper through many centuries. The miners try and determine in which direction the flow once went and then tunnel out in that direction and in the opposite direction. Miners are rarely successful first time, but with commitment, the mining process is very effective. So 35 metres down below the surface, uh, they're looking for sapphire. Uh, they found a few bits of zircon, quite nice zircon, in fact a couple of green zircons uh, earlier this morning. Uh, one or two small yellow sapphires, but not yet the, the big blue one that we're all looking for. That's what I've got to climb back up now. 35 minutes, meters. Quite a long way. These guys are much, much fitter than I am. But uh, first things first, let's get the camera safely out here. And uh, then I'll start the ascent back up. So when you come up from underground, you have no idea what's going on on the surface. As we mentioned earlier on, in Sri Lanka right now, it's the monsoon season. So it's like being at home in England. Uh, we've come up and uh, yeah, very, very wet indeed. After experiencing the alluvial mining process for mining sapphires, Steve asked sapphire mining expert Ajmal about how the mine supports its local workers. Ashmal, so here they're, they're yeah, sort of yeah, more like a co-opted mine. Yeah, yeah that, that's what he right. says. He says that after they clean, after they wash the illam and all any larger stones, they to keep it. Plus, they give a percentage out of the sales also to them. Plus, the smaller stones which they find below three carat and below. Yeah. They give the to the uh, working crowd here. Under they, they work under a manager and there's a group. Yeah. So it's given to them and then they will. Uh, you sell it in the market and uh, divide the spoil. That's good. Uh, changes and they, they, good. they're all happy. Good. I mean, they work very, very hard, but I guess that, I mean, they're, they're earning some serious money at the end of the day and yeah. uh, and everybody seems to be smiling and happy, which is <laughs> the, the best way of telling whether a mine's ethical and well mined is yeah. if everybody's smiling and these guys are always, always smiling. <laughs> they, all, they all like to do this because it's... Yeah. it's uh, Paybacks are good in this, yeah, uh, yeah. than the labour daily wages and things like that. So. Yeah, in, in the UK people rely on the lottery for a, for a big <laughs> amount of money, <laughs> but here they, there's no lottery. Yeah, no there's lottery, they the are hard work. The, the hard, hard work, work and the lottery is when it is finding the sapphire. Sapphire, yeah. yeah. Plus, plus anyway, if, if you don't find the sapphire, yeah, there are the small, small stones. Yeah. The owner gives to them, back, them so they can do the next uh, next thing project. again, project again. Excellent. So that's how they keep the crowd here together. Right? Yeah. It goes on and on from one to another. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been really appreciated. He has been the one who has been... Yeah, Stuti. Stuti. <laughs> and how do I say thank you very much? Bohomi Stuti. Bohomi Stuti. <laughs> after getting particularly muddy, Ajmal recommends Steve a local river nearby where miners usually bathe after a hard day's work. Deep in the rainforest, even our 100-legged friend decides to join us. As the heavens open, we hear a thunderstorm brewing and we're reminded of our visit during the monsoon season. 
typically ranging between May and September. Ratnapur is often humid, with temperatures of 27 to 32 degrees centigrade in May and humidity levels often reaching 80%, meaning a cool off in a river, albeit muddy river, is still quite tempting. With a tough day of gem hunting tomorrow, Steve travels back to his hotel to speak to Brian about his day. It's a great day. Yeah, brilliant. I enjoyed yeah, it. Yes. You have seen the people go inside the mine, go inside the mine and take out the illum. Yeah. And then, you know, the best thing is that the miner take out what is below three carats, they are just the profit sharing among themselves. That's and good. And above three carats, the, the mine owner is getting the benefit of it. Yeah, real proper cooperative, isn't it? Yeah. I felt everybody was happy and even d deep down in the shaft, there's a sense of real purpose for them because they know the smaller ones they keep and the bigger ones is what's paying their salary. Yes, and you can see they are smiling. Yeah. It's a really great thing. They are very happy for them. They are very happy people. You had enjoyed the day? It was uh, fantastic, yeah. Yeah, how do you feel when you're inside the mine? It's a, it's a long way down, and I'm not fit as I should be. Those guys are extremely strong. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> that was ex excellent. Tomorrow we are going to Beruvela. Okay. It's known as Chinatown. Okay. We are seeing there 80% of the population is doing the gem cutting and they're selling it over there. It's a really exciting place. You'll love to see, you'll see lots of cutting gems, good gems from over there. Excellent, I'm looking forward to that. Today we're heading due south to visit the gem cutting and trading village of China Fort. It is some 50 miles from Ratnapura, located in an area known as Baruwala. China Fort has for over 100 years been a thriving gem trading region. Steve meets with Ajmal's cousin, Malbrook, who is their personal gem contact in the area. Malbrook introduces Steve to his father, Wafa Sali, who is 86 and a second generation gem guru. And after trading some gemstone stories, we are also impressed to learn that Waffa has been trading gemstones at the fort for over 70 years since the age of 16. Marlbrook's house is at the epicentre of the market and dealers. Upon arrival they would find world-renowned gem carver Ronald Stephen brokering deals and buying gemstones. Miners and lapdris all line up at his purpose-built annex to show off their latest discoveries. Steve is shown several rough samples, some of amethyst and quartz, and observes as Ronald conducts business with the local gem traders. After negotiating on a few pieces with Malbrook, by 3pm it's now time to set off to the street, where some three to four hundred people are buying and selling gemstones. Within minutes, Steve and Malbrook are surrounded by many gem traders, all vying for attention. And nearly everything out of Ratnapura comes here to get traded, certainly the sapphires. You can tend to buy some of the other gemstones at the mine, but when you bind them and they're cut and they're finished, always here uh, in China Fort. Traders offer gems from $10 to $10,000 per carat, with the potential to seal hundreds of small deals in a very short space of time. We, a few years ago, yeah. we had a parcel from Tonduru yeah. that was a colour change sapphire, yeah. and it was beautiful. Beautiful, not, not big sizes. Small, small pieces. Yeah. One carat, two carat. Maximum, yeah, yeah. yeah maximum. maximum yeah. Mainly five by four. But very good something. quality. Yeah. Good quality also, like Alexandrite. Yes. Yeah, yes. like Alexandrite. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's vital to identify exactly what you're looking for and determine a good deal from a bad deal quickly. When examining gemstones, Steve looks for many elements that distinguish an excellent specimen. However, the foremost common details considered in the industry when securing a quality gemstone are described as the four C's. The first C we look for is colour. The colour of a gemstone refers to the hue, tone and more importantly, the even saturation of colour within the gemstone. This can make the difference between a poor stone and a highly exquisite gem, being highly sought after by collectors worldwide. 
Secondly, we look for clarity. Almost all gemstones can contain some type of inclusions formed during crystallisation. Some gemstones, for example emerald, are acceptable with inclusions, whilst others are graded on how clean they are. Then we look for carat. Gemstones are always measured in carat weight when cut and commonly in grams as rough. Additionally, there are 100 points in every carat, so every point counts. And last but definitely not least, we come to cut. The cut is the most misunderstood and underestimated of the four C's. The cut should never be confused with the shape of the gemstone. This is the three-dimensional form, whilst the cut is the direct manipulation of the gemstone's facets by the lapidrist. Many factors are involved here, including the vision, experience and expertise of the lapidrist. If accomplished perfectly, a truly exquisite gemstone can be crafted into a thing of beauty. Business is conducted on the street at China Fort Market with rough, preformed and faceted pieces all changing hands. Next, Steve is presented with an incredibly rare 24 carat star sapphire, costing around $5,000 a carat, therefore meaning the complete cost of the piece is worth $120,000. Yeah. This is a cornflower blue asterism sapphire from Salon. No heat? Totally, no heat, totally no natural? Heat. No, no, natural. 100% natural. And, and the carat weight on this one? This is 24.84. 24 carats. And what's the price on this one? Hello. Uh, let's think about one. That is $5,000 a carat. Wow. Wow, wow. So 120000 something like that yes, for the for stone. Yes, for the and who will buy that eventually? What, some, somebody like yes, a big Italian jeweller or mostly who, uh, mostly French? Or people. Then Steve is presented with a near identical star sapphire of the same size, totalling a quarter of a million pounds in the palm of his hand. My Brooks friend here is a, a cutter and he's cut the most beautiful Chrysler barrel. It's with a cat's eye. It's 11 carats. 1106. 1106. And the 0 0.06 makes a big difference because when you're talking $6,000 a carat, every point something makes counts. a big every difference. Every, every time that grinding wheel goes round, you're going, more dollars, more dollars, gone, <laughs> gone, gone. <laughs> this is uh, $60,000 for this stone. Um, if it had got a bit of colour change, of course, it would then become Alexandrite and then probably fifteen, twenty thousand $20,000 yes. a carat. So, uh, beautifully cut. I wouldn't have the nerves to cut a stone like this. <laughs> it's beautiful, thank you very much. After all the thrill of the day, a few parcels of interest have been identified. So Steve and Malbrook take the gemstones to the local gem testing centre to ensure that they are purchasing natural gemstones. It is also vital to check the authenticity of what would be a natural gemstone, as there are some synthetic materials on the market. These man-made products are made in laboratories and have very similar physical properties as the natural gems. At the local EGL lab, Steve sets up a deal whereby all the gemstones bought will be checked and certified. The process is extremely detailed, examining and recording all the relevant details of each gem packet. Firstly, a qualified gemologist cleans, weighs, measures and examines the gemstone through a loop. Secondly, the gemstone is inspected under a refractometer discovering the true refractive index to precisely determine the mineral structure, therefore revealing the gemstone's authenticity. At this stage, if further testing is needed, a polariscope accurately distinguishes any pleochroism in the gemstone, narrowing the category even more. The gemstone is then studied under a microscope to uncover any inclusions or treatments the gemstone may have had. And finally, colour change gemstones such as sarite or alexandrite are checked under both incandescent and daylight lamps to confirm the gemstone's colour change potential. Moving on, Steve is taken to see the cutting process in action at China Fort. Here, Ralph, who has been specialising in only cutting star sapphires for over 40 years, shows Steve his technique and method. Already a third generation gem cutter, after school each day, his two sons come and watch him to learn the trade. Most of the stones that come out of Sri Lanka are actually cut before they leave the country. In fact, one of the things the government are doing is trying to make sure the stones are cut at source. And if you buy, buy a salon sapphire, there's every chance it's been cut in a very traditional way. This is not about saving money, this is about using techniques that are generations old 
and it, it's a, regardless of time, whether it takes a day or two days to cut, it's always going to have the maximum amount of colour coming through that table facet because the lapidus has got so much time and so much, uh, you see literally he's visually expecting it after every three or four turns of the lap. The next day, Steve was due to visit a moonstone mine, but unfortunately we hear that the monsoon had flooded the mine shafts and it would be days before they could be pumped dry. Instead, we decide to visit Gale Fort, a beautiful city on the south of Sri Lanka. A stunning World Heritage Site, Gale Fort sits south of Colombo. It is the location of a large Dutch fort built during the occupation of Ceylon between the 16th and 17th century. Over the past few centuries, it's been a hub of gem trading activities. With over 60 gem and jewellery stores within its walls, you can see numerous pieces of beauty within just a short space of time. It is also a popular tourist destination and many decide to retire and live a life of leisure here. However, after the tsunami hit in 2004, Sri Lanka's tourism was severely damaged and much of the town of Gale outside of the fort was destroyed but those buildings on the inside escape virtually untouched. Though since, Sri Lanka has courageously battled back and we are pleased to say, faring very well again after the tragic events. Finally, Steve meets back up with good friend and sapphire expert, Ajmal, to discuss and finalise some gem deals made at China Fort. It's a long-winded process bringing you gemstones. First of all, Mother Nature takes millions of years to create the gemstone. Then it can take years and years searching the ground to find them. Then weeks and days to cut the gemstone. Once they're cut, you've then got to go through literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of parcels to select the ones you want. You've then got to measure them all. Then you've got to try and put them uh, into the same colours, the same hues, uh, the same tones. And we bag them all up. So literally just one auction with 25 pieces in can have, can have taken six, seven hours just to select the gemstones. After seeing many various parcels and discovering the blue sapphire he desired, Steve found just two packages that were cut for maximum beauty and not carat weight. Assembling an exquisite collection of around 140 pieces exhibiting stunning, vivid cornflower blues. So as well, we've had a great week with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. From the buying at the, the rough at the mines, we saw some, some great sort of rough gem material, to the wonderful pieces we got in the market wow. with your relatives and your house right in the central uh, 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 of China Fort. Uh, and we saved the best to last. You've uh, <laughs> shown me your personal collection. There's one I can't afford to buy from your right. personal collection yes. for a fact. Uh, t tell everybody uh, that's watching right now about this very special gemstone. Okay, this is a rough stone, it's about 185 carats. We found it in the mines here. And we have cut for 123 carats and uh, we have uh, hoped to sell it for about $5 million for the piece. Wow, do you think that goes to the American market or more maybe It is Asian? more oriental, yeah. it is more Asian market. Yeah, they're very much into, into the, 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 yes. the asterism and the, 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 the chitoyancy. The rich Chinese or the Taiwanese. <laughs> yeah. Well, best of luck on your five million sale. Thank you very much. Uh, but thank you for the three that I've managed to purchase from you. Uh, we love all paparaccia. We, know we don't mind even the beryllium-treated paparaccia as long as it's disclosed, uh, disclosed properly. But here's two completely natural pieces that uh, will be making its way into the Larique collection. Uh, and a ruby that won't make its way into Larique. Uh, it's an unheated local piece from Ratnapura that I bought for my wife. As our journey to Sri Lanka comes to an end, we would like to thank you for joining us on this adventure. We've seen just a little of this country's abundant beauty and culture and reminded how this trade directly supports the livelihoods in this remarkable nation. By seeing firsthand all of the effort, skill and diligence involved in the mining and cutting trade, we are truly proud to bring some of the rarest and most outstanding gemstones the world has to offer directly to you.